How are you doing? Um, just thought I'd do a little VT today to chat to you about first time resolution or most commonly known as FTR. It is a new metric um, for measuring customer experience that has been introduced over recent weeks. And I just wanted from an efficiency team perspective and focus to just bring some of the actions that we've taken, some of the information that we've gleaned and equally some opportunities there for you to life um, so that we're all starting at the same point together. We've done some great work and just a massive thank you for landing the briefs with your team, getting them across the e-learning on Thrive, that's been brilliant. We've also set up some sessions for you as leaders to be able to manage FTR with your teams. So understanding the FTR report is key to your role, but it's also key to those coaching sessions with your people as well. The feedback from the sessions has been amazing. So thank you for A, for the attendance, but B, um, for just getting across FTR and really bringing it to life with your teams. We know it's an easier metric sometimes than NPS, um, but it is one that we need to wrap our arms around. As a site, we're doing relatively well. Um, our target this quarter is 83.5. So to get us there, we have broken the target down over the quarter. So really looking at about 81.8 to 82% week on week to help us achieve that target at the end of the quarter. We are a bit behind the curve. Um, so are other sites, so we have seen a dip in FTR over recent weeks. But I'm just going to give you some hints and tips today that will help us recover some of that performance. So week to date, we're sitting at 79.1 for, for last week. It's always a week behind, so that'll be week 30 FTR. Week 31 doesn't mature to the end of week 32. That is an increase of 0.7% on the previous week where we come in at 78.4. So definitely moving in the right direction. We had eight advisors that were over 100% FTR. We had 35 advisors over 90. And we had 82 advisors over 85 already. The opportunity really is those advisors that are between 70 and 84, and also those advisors that are sub 70 which we have 26 advisors in week 30 that were below 70% FTR. So not a lot, but they can make a massive difference to the overall site. So let's look at those and use the report to identify A, if they're in your team, B, if they're in your team, what was it that attributed to that low performance that week? And C, is that a trend for them? And if it is, coach them off the back of it in terms of hints and tips to help really drive and improve that FTR. When we look at the report, it is broken down by a weekly FTR number. It's broken down for your team, overall, unit, site, but we have a 13 week trend in there as well. You're able to listen to the originating call that landed here and also the repeat call where the customer called back to understand is it the same reason they call back or is it something different? Now we'll talk about that in a few moments, but what I want you to focus on just now is utilizing that report weekly um, and really being all over it with your team. I've done a little bit of work on it and there's a new brief to come out with some updated FAQs that I think you'll find really useful, but it also summarizes some of the questions that you asked when our business support team was doing the summary with you. Now, one of those things um, we looked at is for Dunfermline with different campaigns, our FTR on broadband SCTs is greater than our FTR on mobile. Now, we need to understand what sits behind that. Some of it is process, some of it will be customer behaviour, and some of it will be advisor behaviour. The advisor behaviour is the one that we can really influence in terms of coaching. The customer behaviour we can influence to a degree, and the process is where we really need to feed that insight into what processes are impacting our first time resolution at initial point of call. So to do that, we've put some insight together. We've asked you that when you're listening to your calls, that you go into the customer experience team page and you record what you're hearing. And that's broken down at unit level. And the reason we've asked you to do that is, A, we need to be listening to the calls, so we can't drive the metric if we don't understand what our people are doing, how it impacts, but equally what we can do to help them. 
We've also put it there to be able to break down, is it about what we can influence? Is it advisor behaviour, customer or process? So far, what we've gleaned from the calls that have been added is great. We can see a couple of things. So from a process perspective, mobile pack is definitely impact of first time resolution. That whole process, mobile returns, when we don't advise the customer of the length of time it will take to receive the packaging, that's drive and repeat calls. Also from a mobile perspective, non-account holders. So we know that a lot of mobile customers are non-account holders, and when they call, um, they won't always be able to transact, therefore that will drive another repeat. And there are more processes that will influence that, that we're picking up on and we'll look at. Some we won't be able to change, but some it's about understanding what can we do more around that and focus on it. From a customer behaviour, we've started to see customers that are in debt repeatedly calling. They get to the point where they just want to speak to somebody and they know if they keep calling, eventually somebody will do what they want them to do. The reality is, no matter who they speak to, nobody will be able to switch their services back on until that debt has been fulfilled in their account. So that's where we probably need the coaching with our advisors to be a little bit more firm in terms of telling the customer that. Also for customer, we're seeing deferrals come through. So we've spent a lot of time talking to them about products, you know, really getting them excited, but maybe they're not the decision maker. When they then go offline and chat to the decision maker and call back through, that's a repeat call. So there's a couple of changes we want to make around that. So what we would like your advisors to do now with deferrals is to acknowledge the deferral, ask the customer when that decision maker will be home. So for example, Mr. Beveridge is who I need to speak to. So Carol, you've said you need to speak to Jim. What time will Jim be home for you to have that conversation? I'm here till eight o'clock tonight, or I'll be able to call you tomorrow. When would suit? If that customer is what we would call a true deferral and really want that offer, they will absolutely bite your hand off and bite our people's hand off to arrange that call back. We need to ensure that there is a real appetite for the customer to take up the offer, but we also need to set some clear expectations with our customers too, and our people, in that we can only ever do the call once, so we need to be clear with the customer, it's one call in 24 hours. If we don't get the customer, set the expectation, we will send them an SMS just to say we tried our call back, the customer will need to call back in. So we won't be trying that customer repeatedly to discuss that referral, it'll be one. So it's key that we make sure we get the right time with the customer. It's important our advisor highlights two things to the customer. One, they may be slightly delayed because they might be kept on their previous call. And two, that they'll only be able to do it once and that they will get the SMS. And that will help us, one, yeah, it will increase an outbound call, but it's the right outbound call. But our advisors need to decide, you know, they'll get, need to gauge from the customer, is it the right thing for that customer? If the customer's hesitant and doesn't want to do it, then let it go. And finally, for that advisor, when they're selling that process to the customer, they need to share the benefits to the customer. So I've just spent the last 45 minutes chatting to you about your account. We've discussed everything in detail. We know what offer that you would like that will be best for you and to save you from calling back in again for another 45 minutes to repeat that to somebody else, I'll offer to do a call back with you tomorrow. We've started that in my unit and it's started to land really, really well, but it's key that our advisors make sure that they're doing it with the right customers. So we're confident that if we pick that one up as an action, that that will reduce um, our repeats, which in turn will improve our FTR. So that's one action leaders I'd like you to take away from the call today and brief your teams on. The other is dropped calls. So we had three simple steps to great FTR, and that was return and drop calls, utilizing the SMS messages, and the third one was an end of call checklist. Now, if our advisor does those three things, their FTR will be the best that it can be as long as the behaviors are sitting right behind it. Now, what we have noticed from the call insight that you've listened into is that we still have a number of advisors that are not calling customers back when the call drops. So we need to really land that message that every time a call drops, they need to return the call. 
On further investigation, what we found is that a couple of advisors hadn't done ID and B in the call early enough, therefore the call dropped and therefore they had no details to be able to call that customer back. So it's important that they do ID and B as early in the conversation as they can. Yes, we need to establish the reason why the customer's called, build a little bit of a connection because people buy people, but it needs to be done quite timely at the beginning of the call to avoid that. So that's the second thing for our advisors is dropped calls. The third one then for our advisors is the ID and V, ensuring that they do ID and V early in the call. So the key message there for us guys is really on coaching is dropped calls, making sure we return them, do ID and V early in the conversation, and land our new deferral process in terms of a call back with our customers. And that's what we've gleaned so far. There will be more, so please keep those calls coming leaders and that insight, and I'll be able to share with you and Gary moving forward what else we're seeing coming through. But there are a few quick tips that our guys need to do just now. When we look at the numbers of when we look at the numbers on the, sorry, you could just probably hear that phone ringing in the background. When we look at the number on the FTR report for customers, there isn't always a direct correlation between that customer volume number and the calls that your team have taken that week. Now, some of you have asked, and I just want to let you know what sits behind that. So the customer number that you see in the FTR report isn't the customer calls, it is the, what we call unique contacts. And what makes up that unique contacts or influences it is three or four different things. So one, if the customer doesn't have an account with us set up and serious or Stan, that will not pull through. All right, so if the account hasn't been completed, that doesn't pull through. And we do get some of those. Secondly, ID and V. We do an ID and V check on the telephone number for FTR. However, if that telephone number on the customer's account and the number they're calling don't match, that will not be included in that unique customer number on the FTR report. If we have third parties calling, like non-account holders, they won't register either or be included in that report. And finally, um, if it's a landline and the customer's calling on a mobile, but the landline is not captured on Sirius as a contact, that won't be included either. So let me put that into a little bit of context for you. So in week 28, for mobile only, we took 7,256 calls in Dunfermline. Of those 7,256 calls that you'll see in our reporting, only 4,537 are captured on the FTR report as unique contacts. Of those, 1,095 repeated, which leaves us with a difference of just over 1,000 calls in that week. And those 1,000 calls will equate to what I've just walked you through as not included. And that's probably normal and that's what we'd expect on a week by week basis. So when you're looking at your numbers and you're trying to coach in and you look at advisor took 80 calls but there's only 20 calls counted for them for FTR, it's all those other reasons that will sit behind it. That's going to come through in the new briefing and that will circulate with you this week. But it is one that we've been looking at and one that I just wanted to share with you. Because when the numbers don't match, sometimes we can lose faith and then not use the report. But it is really important that we use that FTR report every single week. Hopefully that's helped and that will help us get to where we are and help you understand it. But if there's anything else that you need, please lean in and let us know. I'm going to be handing over to Gary Snedden. So we'll just introduce you to Gary Snedden, who's one of the new sales manager in Dunfermline. Hi everybody. And Gary's going to be taking over the efficiency pillar with the media effect. So Gary will continue to take you on the FTR journey and I'll just hand over to Gary for a few words. Thanks for that Carol. Uh, so a lot of great information there and a lot of great hints and tips. So as you know, FTR is an absolutely new KPI that we need to work towards. It's, it's the new customer metric. Currently, as you know, previously we've, we've worked towards MPS and also VIP. I suppose for me, with FTR being the new customer metric, I think they really go hand in hand. 
and going forward I'm going to be linking in with Neil and also James to actually see how we can bring that together and actually get a really good balance and on I suppose through all three KPIs. Uh, I suppose no, what's that? Stop with that. <laughs>